Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Hanlon. I'm the vice chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals and has been designated as acting chair for tonight's meeting. And I'm calling this meeting to order at 7.34 uh, p.m. At the beginning, I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. I'll just go through the roll. Uh, Christian Klein? Here. Roger DuPont? Here. Daniel Ricardelli? Here. Venkat Holy? You, you were here a minute ago. There you go. Venkat, are you here? Yes. Hi. Sorry, there's some issue with my internet. I'm here. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hoffman, unfortunately, can't be with us. Adam LeBlanc? Yeah. And as far as I know, I'm here as well, the chair. Uh, town officials, Colleen Ralston, I know you're here. I'm here. Uh, and the board's uh, 40B advisor, Mr. Haverty? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. So this is the roster for tonight. Um, as as you know, this is a, a deliberation session, and we won't be having uh, a actual public participation except uh, uh, following along. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with the Supplemental Appropriations Act signed into law on March 29, 2023, which extended until March 31st, 2025, the suspension of the requirement um, to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to the, for the remote meeting. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda appointed to or posted to this town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on this meeting's agenda or on the town's website, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. There's only one matter on our agenda tonight, the second deliberation session on the request for a comprehensive permit for 10 Sunnyside Avenue. The record on this application was closed on August 15th, 2023, and as a matter of law, we are not permitted to accept new information at this point. Therefore, we will not be taking comments from the public, the applicant, or anyone else, although we will, of course, consult with our legal advisor, Mr. Haverty. Um, having gone through those preliminaries, uh, you, you all have before you the draft that was circulated earlier today with uh, which reflects the changes that uh, the body that this body uh, uh, agreed to uh, last week on September fifth, uh, and uh, and with some additional uh, amendments, and there's some agenda that is left uh, for us to cover. So last week we covered the findings, we covered waivers, and we covered all of the conditions. Until we got to um, until we got to part, part I guess it's part E. And I'd like to start there tonight and pick up with uh, where we left off on part E, uh, even though there are some other amendments and changes that will on the matters that we already dealt with. But it, we'll go through E to the end, uh, and then we'll turn back to looking at the facts. Uh, and uh, so some earlier conditions that have some changes in them and and the uh, waivers, which generally are just a few uh, odds and ends. And then I hope that we'll be ready to uh, begin the process of winding up this here the winding up this proceeding, which began with a hearing back on May, May 2nd. So we've been at this for a while, although by 40 B standards, that's I guess not that long. Um, that being, if there's no objection to that procedure, I'd like to draw our attention or turn our attention to uh, uh, Part E, Project Design and Construction. So I need to ask uh, Colleen to make me a co-host again. When I crashed out, I lost my privileges. All set. 
Right. Okay, Thank so you. we'll follow the, the procedure we did last time as we go through all of these things and make decisions on uh, individual uh, potential amendments. Uh, Mr. Klein will uh, will put those into the will make those changes there so that at the end of the proceeding uh, of our discussion tonight, before we look at the at the proposed permit as a whole. Um, we'll have a, a complete draft that doesn't need to have anything else um, entered into it. Mr. Haverty, did you want to? Your your box just turned, you had a yellow border. So I thought that that's it's weird. I don't know. Maybe right. some background noise. Okay. All right. So we're at E. And uh, the first place that we haven't indicated a change was at the bottom of E1, but I've never been able to figure out what that proposed change was. I think uh, there's an extra carriage return. I see. Okay. <clears throat> well, I, I assume that we'll accept that one. <laughs> and I'm so, worried that if I fix it, it'll change all the numbering. So I'm going to wait. <laughs> <laughs> That's yes. I, that would be, that is a danger. Um, the next one is uh, has to do with is uh, and has been here as in, in here for some time. It addresses the uh, procedure for a pre-construction conference with members of the public um, and with others as well, um, and is sort of similar to the what we did in eleven sixty four five R. Uh, 1165 uh, R. Um, this also, make sure that I'm correct about this, but this also includes the provision that was suggested by the applicant uh, about maintaining a open website that would uh, keep people informed of the nature of, of the activities that are taking place in real time um, and that this would be open, as the last sentence says, uh, access will be uh, prominently posted at the construction site during the construction period, so people who are interested can log on, and uh, and and get the information that that they want. Um, so I wonder if there's any. Does anyone have any comment, one way or the other, on this one, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Dupont. So as I am looking at that, I just sort of flagged. Um, the middle of the paragraph where it says, additionally, the applicant shall prepare a list of additional parties interested in notice and shall provide notice to such parties. I wasn't exactly, sure, exactly sure what that entails because the provisions of 40A Section 11 are really clear. So they say, you know, who gets notice, how, and all of that. But this additional parties interested, I didn't know how to define that. So I think if we're, it's prescriptive, and if you're telling them they have to do this, I'm not sure how they identify those additional parties interested and how notice would be given. So per perhaps that's already figured out and I just had missed it, but that, that's the question I have on that. So the applicant, whoops, the applicant, hold on, we seem to have lost Mr. Holy here. So this was intent. In. Okay, great. This the the applicant uh, the applicant's lawyer uh, had indicated that uh, basically they were uh, including a that basically the the focus is basically going towards. Uh, hold on a second. Right. When that was drafted, it was, I was thinking a lot about the applicant statement that the uh, website uh, would be open to anyone who wished to who wished to, uh, to have it. That basically it would be just quite free to anyone to sign up. So and that included the question originally was, did that include everybody on Michael Street? And the answer is yes, and it includes the whole world if they want. Um, and so the point there was simply to uh, address that. Um, I guess I'm not wholly clear that, I mean, that its position there is just before we get to the website. And so it looks, it's, it's in an odd spot. 
uh, for that. And I, I, I agree that it would be very difficult. Um, um, it would be, be, that's a little bit different. I guess the question I have here is what happens if it turns out that, um, that people who are other than parties in interest um, express the, I mean, maybe the right thing there is that the applicant should also provide notice to anyone who requests it. In other words, they don't have to reach out and identify people to offer to notify. But if people call, mm -hmm. if people say we want to be notified of this, uh, whether we're in a party of interest or not, that they are also entitled to get the, the notice of the meeting. That's what I was thinking. So that it, it's the sort of the onus is on people who may not be parties in interest. If they want to be included in a list, then they're the ones who have to say, put me on the list. Yeah. I guess quit request to be notified. Is that the okay? That would be an improvement, I think. Is there any other comment on this one? Is it generally acceptable? Looks work looks fine to me. Okay. Why don't we move on then to the uh, to the next one? Um, here, the next one is E six. On E five is essentially the same um, addition. Uh, provide advance notice to butters and other residents expressing interest per the town. Yeah. Correct. And and that's more or less resolved in the same way. Yeah. Now, E6 has got a question from Mr. Haverty, which is a very short question, which I'm not sure has a short answer. And I wanted to raise this with you. Um, the I don't think that it is true that appropriate signage, um, that the approved plans actually have anything on signage. And I wonder, Mr. Klein, if you can address that. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned with with uh, both the par with the paragraph and ultimately, if we don't have a paragraph like that, there's a permit requirement for some signage provisions in our bylaw, which is raises a complication. So how would, how do you think that we should be dealing with the signage issue? So I'm going back to the, let's take a quick look at the documents that were submitted by the applicant um, and see if any of the renderings included signage and they did not. Um, so then we have a couple of options in that regard. Um, so thinking back to other projects, um, there were some comments that we had to include about site signage at, um, at Thorndike Place because they had you know substantial site signage right. uh, for traffic and stuff like that. Uh, that's not really the case here. Um, I don't recall us that doing very much in terms of 1165R or um, 1021, 1027 Mass Ave. Um, I think here we could um, so this is like this is the street rendering that they provided to us um, we could if we wanted to we could you know limit signage to the horizontal band to the area of the horizontal band um, which would sort of place where it is um, you know we could do something along those lines um, I think the safest course of action is to just simply require appropriate signage to be shown on the final plans mm -hmm. consistent with the Arlington Zoning Bylaws sign requirements. So then as long as whatever they show is consistent with the bylaw, it's you know not really a, of a concern. 
and it's covered in the permit. If they want, if they come back and they want something, you know, that requires relief, then they're going to have to request a modification. Right. Is there anything that, because the board no longer has jurisdiction over signage, it's not something that I've paid much attention to. I do notice that there's a permit requirement. Is there anything that needs to be said to say that? Well, this, this is a comprehensive this permit. This is so the permit, right? All local permits. So, we, so the we, only thing we want to do is make sure that we're stating that it has to comply with the bylaw. Okay. So would it be helpful to say the substantive provisions of the bylaw just to make clear that we're not dealing sure. with the procedure? Yep. Uh, Mr. Chair? Um, Mr. Mr. LeBlanc? Uh, would it be appropriate for us to add ex uh, exterior signage uh, at, in between appropriate and signage just to make clear that it's the exterior because there's a whole lot of interior signage that needs to be done yeah. as well. I think that's fair. And I think the last sentence of that paragraph is still just fine. Yeah. Does anyone have anything else to suggest about signage? All right. If there's no objection, we could treat this one as done and go on to the next. Um, Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont. Um, could we just go back up to E5? I didn't, I may have lost that change because um, where it says and other residents expressing interest, are we going to change that to other residents requesting such notice? Is that was that the thinking sort of consistent with the prior comments on the we could do requesting notice again yeah yeah Here, I imagine this is all actually all kind of a post website sort of thing. So if they're doing what they say they're doing on the website, they will have automatically addressed this one. Okay. That just matches the language now. Yep. All right. The next the next one I have is E8. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to raise before we get there? Okay. This is a great, this is actually a great uh, thing about the project, the fact that it's all electric. Um, the applicant, uh, basically, we all along, there has been a question about whether or not domestic hot water would be electric. Uh, and the applicant's final position on that is that they would will make it gas, but they'll also, you know, make it convertible to uh, electric when it becomes uh, when it becomes feasible. The way in which the applicant had suggested a condition would have actually required them to use gas, which they disavowed, and so this draft here is is an effort to sort of capture where I think that the applicant finally was. Um, so it requires the project to be all electric, which is similar to where the draft we started with, uh, except that natural gas may be used for domestic hot water if do electric domestic hot water is not reasonably feasible. If the project uses natural gas for domestic hot water, it will be designed to provide future electric uh, domestic hot water service. Uh, so and that basically, I guess the only thing that is in there in, in fairness is that uh, while they have repeatedly said that what they're looking for is whether or not the domestic hot water is feasible, that's, that was the problem that they were trying to address throughout the course of the proceeding. Uh, we haven't really directly uh, addressed that. And I kind of took that from the tenor of the discussion as a way of determining when they would or when they wouldn't use natural gas. Uh, I think their underlying position is that if 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 the if if they can afford it, 
um, they would prefer domestic hot water, but they it's a struggle for them and and for and for many others who are doing multifamily as well. Mr. Chairman, I just have one sort of uh, question of language. Sure. So, um, so where it says to be designed to provide future electric, um, I was wondering if it would be appropriate to say to provide for conversion to future electric. And the and the only reason I asked the question is because I don't know if when you're designing a system, you design an either or electric or gas and whether or not there's some sort of way that you can actually sort of design it in anticipation of converting over. So it's probably not a big deal right. either way, but I just thought to provide for conversion to future electric wouldn't harm, wouldn't hurt it. Or maybe even enable would be a better word. Sure. To enable yeah. future electric because this is really a lot like the wiring for EV charging and things like that that are going on well, in all of this. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chair. Mr. LeBlanc. Um, I was just wondering if maybe we wanted to, I, I don't know the specific language off the top of my head, but um, the new specialized stretch code that the town adopted at town meeting has some language around this um, because it is kind of a, a compliance path with the with that code um, to you can have a mixed fuel building, um, and they have some some good language I think around that. Yeah, but the applicant is not is doing an all electric building. Well, no, it's that's true. They're not because they're the it's uh, it's it's. Uh, because of the domestic hot uh, water, if they use domestic hot water, it won't be all electric. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not 100% clear what, what, I mean, there, if you have domestic hot water, uh, I mean, if you have a mixed fuel building, there are other implications about uh, other standards that are applicable and so forth. But I'm not sure I, I can think of anything that, that would relate to this. I mean, you're not required to do all electric uh, by definition, if it's a mixed fuel building. Um, it's a little bit dodgy figuring out how the specialized switch code applies to multifamily and on, on this part as well. But I, <clears throat> what would you, what would you suggest? I mean, I, I, I know that there's a lot of la there's language in the stretch code in the specialized stretch code sure. that deals with this, but I'm not sure what, I mean, there's no point in our restating that. And uh, what is the point from the stretch code that you think we should be should be in the the permit? I think the words conversion to help um, make this more solid. Right, because I think I don't think that the thought of eventually current converting to electricity is in the mixed use pathway. I mean, the, the the obligations that come from being mixed use have to do largely with your building envelope and that sort of thing, solar and and various other things like that. But I don't think that, well, there is a general requirement for, well, you're right. There is a general requirement for wire, for providing wiring, pre-wiring for, exactly. for conversion to electric. Yeah. Mr. Chair, yeah, Mr. Riccardelli. I, but I think I think the language that uh, we just um, reviewed and what's on the screen now, uh, you, you know, if they're they're following the specialized stretch code anyways, they they're already beholden to that, so we don't need to restate that they need to pre-wire and uh, do all those all those things that are part of the the code. Um, I think that this stating that it enables the future conversion to electric. Is is good enough because they'll be following that that new specialized stretch code either way. Yeah, they, well, at least they will if they get their first berm, building permit after after January first. Yes. Okay, so are we satisfied with the language that that now doesn't have any red in it anymore? Yeah. Okay. Um. 
the next Mr. chair yes mr if Hoy. i may um if i have one small thing wouldn't um the way i was i'm thinking is couldn't any project be able to convert to electric um irrespective of what the system currently is so it could we just say that um, the current design to enable future conversion so that the current design incorporates things that will enable or make it more ready you know, to pick up the word that you said on the solar readiness. Um, well, yeah, they, they actually will have solar, but I don't, I mean, this isn't intended to insist on solar re residents. No, what I'm, what I'm saying is that it, any project could be converted in the future, right? Um, so how is this different than any other project is that the current design should have some features in a way that would enable the conversion, right? Right. Mm -hmm. that's, so how is that? That's correct. I mean, basically facilitate isn't quite enough and enable is too much. Uh, but what you're aiming at is conceivably I mean, really, actually, Mr. Holy, this is similar to the point that Mr. LeBlanc is making and attempting to find a way to, I mean, with, in the stretch code, it's pre-wiring. It, it's pre -wiring. Right. And I frankly don't know what it is with domestic hot water because that involves some, a, a different set of problems than the problems that come from changing to heat pumps. Um, so I... I don't really have the knowledge and I don't think we have in the record the knowledge sure. to be able to be much more specific. So I guess. Um, do we want to leave it at enable or do enable and facilitate? I would, I don't mind saying enable and facilitate. I think that that works. Yeah. I mean, remember that this is actually one where we're not, Beating on their head, we're just basically yeah. accepting right. their their offer. I, yeah. Okay. E ten. E ten. This is the essence <clears throat> of E ten. Was the request of the applicant to say that the undergrounding only is the is only in the. Uh, was when you're it has to do with utilities that are entering the property that they're they, they don't have an obligation to change overhead lines and so forth that already exist and that are out and that don't actually enter into their property um, and it's a request that comes from the applicant does anyone have any comment on that That's fine. Okay. Uh, the next major change is E12. So this is a lot like the federal budget where we add four or five conditions, but then we have to subtract one in order to balance it. Um, but they're not doing soil testing and they're not doing infiltration. So it, it I think it's superfluous. Okay, the next one is E13. This is relates to the the concerns that were expressed by the applicant on the the need for going outside the ordinary hours of operation. And I wonder, Mr. Klein, if you could explain this one. Sure. Um so essentially, the could, the waiver request was to change the uh, the weekday hours from starting at eight a.m. to starting at seven a.m., and then the Saturday hours to eight a.m. from nine a.m. Um, and then what we are doing here as well, what is more enumerated in the uh, the waiver request, is that we are removing Sunday and the holiday hours, um, sort of as a to balance it out. Um, right. And then the part that's here in blue and red, uh, the hours may be extended on a temporary basis 
as necessary by written agreement with the Director of Planning and Community Development. It's a little more affirmative than the request from the applicant, which was just that upon notice of the Director of Planning, and if the if there's no response within 14 hours, 14 days, it's assumed to be accepted. I think it's more important that it that there be an affirmative response. And just to point out that there's also nothing in here about extraordinary circumstances or anything like that. It's essentially, if it's reasonably necessary, the example that uh, Ms. O'Connor gave us had to do with pouring concrete and where you can't just stop in the middle because it changes its nature overnight. Um, so is there any further discussion? Is there any discussion of this one? All right. If there's no objection, we can proceed to E14. See, with, with E14, Klein, maybe you should start by sort of explaining this. So E14, the that that first line, the one that's highlighted, used to be a part of E13. Um, but we had it just sort of felt sort of tacked on, so I had pulled it off. But then we did have some conversations about where about parking and not having construction people park on the street. Um, and so I just wanted to add this second line that the contractor may make arrangements to park vehicles on adjacent private property, but public ways only, but public ways may only be used for deliveries by a prior arrangement with the town of Arlington unless included in an approved CMP. So that basically when they're developing the CMP with the town, they can include in their provisions about parking and whatnot, but it's th that they know that they can't just assume they can park on the street that it has to be a part of the CMP. Okay, so what the there's a <clears throat> when we we dealt with this on August 15th and Mr. Gross Handler um addressed all of this. Um or and I think that the provision that is in the orange sentence uh, relating to arrangements to park in vehicles on adjacent property is one of the things that he said that they were trying to do. Um, he was also agreeable specifically to no parking on Michael Street. Um, he wanted, however, to be able to allow, I, I think the context here was basically controlling employee parking rather than sticking earth moving equipment there but wanted to be able to park where parking was otherwise permitted or, or in front of meters. So this is I mean, somewhat narrower than Mr. Grosshandler thought uh, he wanted, and but it is less specific in that uh, the applicant is perfectly willing to uh, commit now that no matter what, they won't let people park on Michael Street. Um, and I guess for me, at least, I'm not quite sure what works or what doesn't and and uh, whether they need any, anything beyond uh, the, they need any to be able to do the parking that would be prohibited by this. Um, I would sort of like to have some, a bit of language that says that, you know, that whatever happens to the people from, uh, on Michael Street are protected from this. They, there may be some discussions about other things and agreements with the town, but I'd like to have Michael Street have uh, the protection that the applicant was uh, had agreed that they would be provide to them. Um, and I wonder if maybe says in no event shall in no, in no event will employee parking be allowed on, or would con construction parking be allowed on Michael Street? Is that I think that both gives the Michael Street people the protection that that they were offered and also the flexibility that Christian has put into the orange language of being able to 
you know, really to hardship if, if we've got, if there's a problem in some way or, and you, and, and in any event, doing it in the CMP provides enough flexibility that I think it's highly unlikely that this will prove to be a problem with the applicant. Does anyone have anything further on this one? All right. I will, I'll fix the numbering later. The next 18. 18. I think it's, it's evident what that relates to. Is there any discussion? Okay, if there's no objection, let's go on to the next one. I have E22. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I have point. a question about E20, and I... I was just wondering, as I was reading that, I was thinking actually of the town's bylaws with regard to snow removal on sidewalks and such. And I didn't know um, because I think that, you know, the premise is that they are obligated to follow whatever those bylaws are anyway. But I didn't know if it was worth mentioning because one of the things in particular, this is a narrow street. And one of the sections, so it's, it's um, actually... Title Three, Article One, and the applicable sections that would relate to this building would be 25, 26, and 33. And 33 would have to do with not, um, you know, shoveling snow into the street. So, I, I mean, I could take the position that the, it's totally unnecessary to make any reference to the bylaw, which is binding anyway, or I, I didn't know if people felt that it would be useful to make reference to that just to remind them so it's a it's a question i don't really have a suggestion one way or the other i just wanted to so, know what other people thought did the it, christian did this originally have there there was some language about public ways also and something we just looked at mm -hmm. in e18 and that deals with snow also it says snow may not be placed in or adjacent to resource areas or public ways. Does that language take care of what you're looking for, Mr. Dupont? Yeah, so that's that takes care of section 33. And then 25 and 26 are for apartment buildings and businesses. And that's just the requirement that you have to um you have to shovel the sidewalks. And again, I know that that's an obligation that uh stands whether it's stated in this or not. I I just didn't know if anybody wanted to add it just for emphasis. Would it would it work? I mean, what would it, we could do it the way that is being suggested here, where we actually, uh, or would you prefer having something that would say, in effect, the applicant is required to comply with uh, town with all provisions of the town bylaw or with the town bylaw re regulating snow removal or some and give the citation to it yeah i that that would work too i that's kind of how i had it written um but i think you know sort of putting it in text is also fine so i don't mean to be wishy-washy but i think what christian just wrote is also um is fine it just States don't forget right. to do the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds great. Does that work for everybody? Any objection to it? All right, let's, why don't we move on then to uh, 22. Uh, 22 is just basically, I think, of course, recognizing that, that, uh, that there are, there's a waiver of fee fees which will, which happens in the, in the <clears throat> waivers. So after that, the next I have is 26. So th this actually, I guess, was my suggestion. This began saying that they have to pay all the fees and then we, including and listing a bunch of things and then excluding inflow and infiltration fees which has always been the case and now excluding and the things that you are excluding with that blue language is pretty much everything that was included in the including language and i figured 
it would just be simpler and easier to understand if you just eliminated that specificity and stated it more generally. So this is basically, in a way, stylistic and attempting to make it a little simpler. Anyone have any discussion on this one? All right, E29. I can. So I yes, go ahead, Mr. Klein. I was to say, um, so essentially, on the prior project, we had received CMP information ahead of the hearing, um, close of the hearing. Here we did not, um, but this one here was specifically about truck path diagrams, and so had wanted to include in here that the applicant shall submit truck access diagrams to the board showing turning paths for construction vehicles. Approaching, accessing, and departing the site. These diagrams shall be included. And D and approved as a part of the CMP. Um, and then we could further add the last line there that truck access to the site and egress on the site shall be from Sunnyside Avenue and shall not use any neighborhood residential street, including Michael Street. I just don't know you know, turning radius of trucks and all that, how practical that is going to be. Like it's possible, it's very possible that trucks will need to, you know, they can they can come from Broadway down some down Sunnyside, but I don't know if they can if they would actually have room to U-turn or any way turn around before right and whether they would have to leave straight. We could exclude them from Michael Street, which would include them from a you know a larger part of the neighborhood. And then they would need to stay essentially on Sunnyside until they get out to Mystic Valley Parkway. Oh, but to do that, I mean, how would you get out to Mystic Valley Parkway? Sunnyside doesn't go all the way through, although there is a later street that uh, that connects yeah. you up with another street that does. I guess I think I, I'm the one who raised this. I did think it would be it was useful to try to keep people off Michael Street uh, since that could get to be a significant thing. But we don't have much of a record here that shows how feasible that is. I was kind of depending upon the five architects on the board to have a judgment on that. And at least Mr. Klein does have a judgment that it might be problematic. And so I'm willing to back off from this one. Mr. Chair. Mr. Riccardelli. I, I, I agree with what Mr. Klein just said. I, I think we, we might be overly limiting them. And then, uh, you know, if we if we do that, uh, we may be forcing all the trucks onto another small residential street that may, may create another issue, so. Okay. So if nobody is too nostalgic in seeing that go, Mm -hmm. um, we can get on to the next one, which is the F. I think we go over to F. Um, F one looks to me a lot like a stylistic change, but Mister uh, Mister uh, Klein. Well, oh, so basically, it's just a clarification. Um, that access and access from the site is going to be from Sunnyside. That people are not, yeah, you know, it, it should be obvious given that we don't have multiple entry points. Right. Um, but okay. Is there any comment on that one? All right. Why don't we go on to F3? The 11 is the number that was requested by the applicant. Right. There we go. And this corresponds with the um with the waiver request. So the next one's up are F5 and F6, which both deal with the bicycle parking. 
uh, it relates to what we had. We had a discussion in connection with the waiver on on this point, um, and uh, we'll get to that again when we go back to that. So the applicant's proposal, uh, leaving the waiver aside, the applicant originally proposed, I think, seventy two overall spaces and. Uh, in order to obtain additional flexibility, uh, reduce that to 60 long-term and five short-term. Uh, the long-term spaces, um, if I'm not mistaken, I, Mr. Klein, correct me, but I, th I think the bylaw would require 66 of those and six in the short-term, uh, so that this involves a, a slight deviation from what's in the in the bylaw, but not very much. And it was part of what the applicant felt it needed to deal with the uh, with the sort of difficult problems of allocating space on that garage level. Mr. Klein, do you have anything more to say about that? No, 60, 66 and six are the requirement and 60 and five is what they um, have expressly requested. Any other discussion? All right, so let's accept those and move on. F8. F8. So I've learned a lot about F8 in the course of the afternoon, and I'm going to keep my mouth shut on it because I haven't really necessarily studied up for the exam yet. Mr. Klein. So the applicant is showing on their plan, starting with two two vehicle charging stations. Which, so that's the two electric stations serving four vehicles. Um, and then the they shall provide future expansion for five additional parking spaces per the EV charging stations plan. So they provided a plan that shows nine total uh, spaces being char having EV chargers. Um, and that's a, a plan that they had submitted to us um, at one of the subsequent hearings. So and uh, they had said that they were looking to add five additional EV chargers. Um, so there was some question as to whether that meant 10 spaces, 10 additional spaces, but they definitely don't show 12. They definitely show nine. It seems to me pretty clear from the from what from the EV charging stations plan. Uh, and Mr. Ricardelli will no doubt take an interest in this because it was in a colloquy that if I confused myself, it was in a colloquy that he had with the applicant that uh, that where the applicant's answers led to my confusion. Um, but as I understand it, what, what they've really shown, the business about charging stations happened, was discussed briefly, very briefly on August 15th. Um, in fact, if you forgot about the charging stations and you just stuck with what they what they said then and later, it would just be that it would serve four parking spaces that you would you would be EV ready on four, and you would be uh, EV capable on five, and the EV capable is intended. Uh, at least my interpretation of it, when they use the language EV capable, what they mean is what's required um, under the updated stretch code and the specialized stretch code, um, but and which is essentially pre-wiring. Uh, and I, I think this language does that. It it may have too much of a concession to my original idea of trying to clarify what charging stations were, but the essence of it. Uh, appears to me to be there. And I also think it's not going to be a practical problem because this is so closely aligned to what is always going to come up as a building code matter in future developments that Mr. Uh, Chomp is knowing is going to know exactly how to enforce this. It, 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 and I have further comment? All right, so sure. the next one. Yes. Oh, just just confirming that that makes sense to me. I, I agree with that's what that's what I heard too. Um, just echoing what Mr. Klein said that up to nine in the future. Great. Okay, the next one we have here is ten. 
Mr. Haverty, is were you trying to? Oh, I think it's just background. All right. I'll put it on mute. <laughs> I didn't see that it was you either. I just heard something in the background. Um, so number 10, uh, I guess I ought to uh, address this. Um, as you remember from the what we've done in connection with the waiver is we wanted to pay some attention to um, the need to do some kind of a transportation uh, demand management program. Um, and the language that is here is, in, and it is true that much of what is listed in the bylaw is the kind of thing to consider in deciding uh, in having a transportation demand management program is uh, um, is are things that the applicant can't do like charge for parking uh, because of the nature of the financing that underlies the 40b process um, and so or at least that it does in this in, in with their kind of a proposal um, we had a long colloquy with Ms. O'Connor they're really interested in providing things like uh, notification to people and so forth. So the purpose of this is really to uh, require in more detail a transportation man demand management program, which already was required by the draft that uh, Mr. Haverty developed originally, um, but which uh, elaborates it a little bit more and emphasizes their willingness and ability to do um, to do certain things and to provide some basis in the decision for the, a view that we take in the waiver section that we think that what they're that the to, the transportation demand management program that is envisaged here would be sufficient to justify the uh, exercise of our discretion to reduce the number of parking spaces from 39 to 21. Um, and so that is kind of what the purpose of that is. Any discussion? All right, uh, that would bring us to 11. This is something that was discussed on the 15th as well. Uh, everybody thinks that this work ought to be done to uh, repair sidewalks and improve the pedestrian's uh, safety. The, the sidewalk that is just to the south of this site is is something that the residents of this project are going to be walking over all the time as they try to get to the transit options. And uh, it's not in great shape. And the applicant can't do offsite improvements consistent with the financing, as they've told us several times. Um, so this is what they've asked for as a, as a way of defining their commitment to help solve this problem. Mr. Klein, do you have something to say about that? So the request from the applicant was to say, uh, to repair the sidewalk from Broadway, the project site at the town's expense. Um, I had originally put in the language to the extent allowed by the applicants, funders, and lenders, um, which would sort of say so that if you know that if there was anything that the applicant could do, that they could do so. Um, whereas here, if we say to the at the town's expense, it sort of takes them completely off the hook for any possible funding of any kind of uh, repairs. Mm -hmm. But they were very clear that they couldn't pay. So I think this may just be two ways of saying the exact same thing. So it could just say to the extent allowed by the applicants, funders and lenders and at the town's expense. We could do or if that makes more sense. Right. I wonder if it would make sense just in an abundance of caution to say at the expense of the town or other third parties, you never can tell whether there's somebody else who might be able to step up to this a foundation, a foundation or something like that, that isn't the town. It could be the state even.
I would say third parties, not interested parties. Ah, thank you. That probably doesn't make any practical difference, but it, at least it expands it out notionally to include other potential people who could fund it. So That's I would, the way it would look. Yeah. All right. Is there any further discussion of this one? Mr. Mr. Riccadelli, you look like you're... It, it, yeah, may I just ask one question? So, sure. So uh, if I'm reading that correctly, um, support efforts. So are we are we asking them to do the work or just coordinate with potentially the town who would do the work off, off of the property of, of the project site? I think it could be Christian. I'll I'll just quickly. I think it could be any of these things. But working with the department, I mean, it is conceivable that the Department of Public Works would say we'll throw in an ex few extra dollars, and as part of the same construction program that you're starting in, it would be efficient for you to do it mm -hmm. while we do this, and that would be, I'm sure, one of the things that might might do might happen. Uh, but there there could be others and and uh, the second sentence might very well be that they'll support the neighborhood the local neighborhood corporate uh, in getting it done or remember that sidewalk is in front of another building right uh, maybe that person is is willing to get together and and get it done so i think that the idea here is to make it as broad as possible that they should look at the opportunities that there are to to make this work mr klein yeah i mean essentially it's not to encumber the applicant to have to do something but that to the extent that they're able to assist they ought to assist understood this is reminding me of our tree discussion on the last 40b where yeah. once it was off the site it got kind of tricky to ask someone to do anything so right and i understand how why this is a little bit vague in terms of how we phrased it. Some can extend it's aspirational. I mean, if, if all of us and all of the people who spoke to us were willing to write to the Department of Public Works and saying, please help do this, pay for this, <laughs> or we could do something at town meeting, but it's, it's hard to deal with these situations, but it, it's better to deal with it this way, I think, than to let it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, understood. All right, number 12, we're in a heavy, there's lots of red here in 12 and 13. Um, so this one, you'll remember that one of the require, one of the things that we've been talking about right from the very beginning is the safety of the entrance at, at the garage. And it has always been agreed that there'll be some sort of visual or auditory warning that is designed to to reduce the, the chance of ac accidents and injuries uh, as people go in and out of there. And this is just a simple sentence that's designed to capture the gist of what that discussion was. Obviously, we don't, we, ne we did not get into the details and ultimately, uh, the town's Mr. Alessi is going to be the person or his successor will be the person who has to decide whether this is an appropriate system or not. Mr. Chair, may, may Mr. I ask Mr. Riccadelli? Does the town have a, do we have a regulation for that or is that just, uh, do we have a requirement for auditory and visual warnings? Well, I don't believe we do. But I don't do we? believe we do. Okay. I, I only ask because um, and just having worked in, you know, Cambridge uh, and other towns in Boston, sometimes the the uh, the bylaw explicitly uh, asks not to have the auditory warning because it's very disruptive to residents because it goes off 
so often during the day and it sounds like an alarm bell. So um, just just posing that question to the group that uh, that's why uh, often in urban settings you'll see the flashing um, sign, but not the, the beeping. Yep. And, and that's, or. That's what I was thinking too. That presumably will we'll capture the attention of the senior transportation planner. Okay, number 13, I'll let Christian, Mr. Klein, why don't you take This one is mine. Um, so it has nothing to do with the garage door anymore. Uh, the applicant, so this was basically, we had discussed establishing a loading zone um, in front of the, the building, in front of the, the project. Um, and there was also some discussion at a prior hearing about the narrowness of the street and the inability to, um, that currently there's parking all the way to the corner. And so it makes it difficult to see around the corner when you're trying to leave the street. So essentially what this is, is the just saying that the applicant shall propose to the transportation advisory committee that the town establish a loading zone on Sunnyside Ave. And in addition, shall request that a no parking zone be established at the corner with Broadway to better accommodate vehicle queuing at the intersection. So all it does, and the applicant has already said that they would be willing to do it, um, is just to basically write a letter to the Transportation Advisory Committee requesting that they investigate making these two changes to uh, the street. Certainly having having no parking at the corner, given there's, there is a lot at rush hour, there's quite a lot of traffic that comes from the neighboring, the parking lot of the building immediately next to them to the south. Uh, and that turns there, and it's it's all kind of hard to see. But you'll come out there, and then you'll make a right turn to get up to Broadway. And clearing that area out will make that an easier maneuver than it is when on, under some some circumstances where there's lots of parking there. All right, is that does that seem acceptable to everyone? All right. That any that means we've graduated from F, and we're willing to, and we're able to embark on G. And there's a surprise at the end. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it, you'll 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 no doubt be delighted to hear it. Um, the first one is to is just to make sure contact information is regularly updated. Is there any discussion of that? Okay. On G five. We 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 talked we talked a little bit about this in general about what they could do and sh and should do and so forth. They obviously don't have a lot of room around. The consensus I think from everyone is that inevitably the fire chief has got to decide what's accept acceptable, and this is entire is intended intended to effectuate that. Christian, is there more to it than that, or Paul? There was a request from the applicant. Um... To sort of to make that change as required by the, the fire chief, I think determined is a better word, just because that the fire chief will make a determination; they won't establish requirements. Yep, that's fine with me. Great. Okay, if there's nothing else, we're ready to go to G six. And G six so, adds in the approved lighting plan, which we'll, yep. which we'll talk about in a little bit, but. The idea is to give effect to what they've already provided. And as you'll remember, there was a lot of discussion about lighting strategies and whether you light things up or in order for you to have safety or whether you don't light them up in order to. And the approved lighting plan was worked out, as I understand it, with the community so that uh, including it in here at least links back to the discussions that we had. So anyone else have any comment on that? All right, so we're now down to eight. Wait a minute, there's, 
You're missing a G? There was something I expected to be in G that. Ooh. Hold on, let me see. It's something? Fire. Let's see if I can see what I had. Well, apparently not. I'm not seeing what it is that I looked at, and I'd have to go back to an earlier draft to try to remind myself what it was. Um, oh, I, yeah, I guess that's, now I just realized it, it was a note I had on G6. Um, I don't feel really strongly about this, but everything else on here has to the heading here has to do with the police and the fire department so anybody reading this opinion is going to look at police fire department sorts of things um and it's when i on the lighting plan it seemed to me that that's more a design issue than a police issue uh and that while you could put it anywhere it's not the first place somebody would go looking for something that has to do with lighting uh, and i wanted to raise with you the possibility that it would be appropriate to move g6 uh, to the portion that deals with design that we already dealt with i don't feel strongly about this uh it's really just a matter of of trying to make it a little bit more user friendly um, but I, and I don't think that Christian necessarily has to immediately do that, but I wonder whether there's anyone else who thinks that, that this might be better located in a different place. I mean, this is sort of couched in the being for the, to ensure the safety of the residents of the project. So it is. Right. It, it's, there's a logical sense to it. Yeah. Actually. We actually, I don't know that if we said, if G were to say police, fire, emergency, medical conditions, and, and public safety, that would solve my problem because it's just really a matter of, of alerting people that this is a place where you might find a provision of this kind. easier adjustment to make yep. yes that's right and at this point that's a significant consideration are we into the h's yes we're ready for it going into the h's h5. the only thing is h5 This is at the request of the applicant to have Public Works work with them on the disconnects. Right. Mr. Chairman, Mr. DuPont. So on H5, when I saw that, um, where we were saying Arlington Department of Public Works shall work with the applicant. So it seems like we are making, we're, we're, uh, directing public works to do something. And I, I wasn't sure whether or not, and, and now that you've said what you said, by the way, it gives me pause, but I didn't know whether it would be better off reversed saying the applicant shall work with the Department of Public Works on permitting disconnects. But maybe if it was requested by the applicant and they want to emphasize to the town that they need the town's help, perhaps it should stay as is but when i read it originally we're we're mate we're directing the applicant to do all these things and then all of a sudden we're directing the department of public works to do something which seems out of keeping with the rest of what we're we're doing so i actually raised that point on august 15th and mr haverty addressed it uh, uh and so i'll give mr haverty a time to catch his breath and then 
if he could remember what he said. I mean, the the applicant does have a fairly persuasive thing that they really need the assistance to do this in order to get the job done. And sometimes there are moratoria that otherwise happen. So you can't do this work and it can lead to long delays. That was, as I recall, that was the basic rationale for it. Um, and Mr. Haverty had, when I raised the same point you did, Mr. DuPont, Mr. Haverty had what I at the time thought was an acceptable answer, but I don't remember what it was. Well, neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> Would people be more- I mean, um, this seems to be appropriate as drafted. I'm okay with it. I just, it just sort of stood out. That's fine. On to I. Wetlands and floodplains. Um, there's only one major change in I that I can see offhand. Yes, it is in I-4. And I wonder if Mr. Haverty, if you could, excuse me, Mr. Klein, if you could uh, address that one. Yeah, essentially this, this was originally written for uh, the projects we had where there were landscaped areas that were within the, under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. Um, and we don't have those kinds of things here, neither do we have lawns. Um, and so just saying that the application of plant nutrients shall comply with, you know, state law and no other herbicides or treatments are approved. Just leave it at that. Is there any discussion of that? Okay. Um, so, the next section, section K, is what has the nice surprise because actually there's not going to be a section K because we skipped over J. So now we're going to make it all J instead, which makes it at least notionally shorter. Um, other than changing the numbers, the major change here is in what will become J5. And I think that, Mr. Klein, correct me if I'm wrong, but that basically is on, came originally from, from I think, either 1165R or 1021 Mass Ave, mm -hmm. and is not really appropriate given what is what is happening here. Yeah, this was more for a more substantial system than is being proposed here. All right. I think that's it. Oh, with with, with this exception, uh, assuming it turns out to be true, uh, there's a blank on the record of the vote, and I'm hoping that you will agree with me that that should that in the decision it's in the last part the record of the vote that we should we would be able to enter twelve there. All right, so we can go back. If if there's no objection, is there anything else on any of the things that we just covered? We have a few more things to raise at the beginning, uh, to in, including the sort of numbering of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the exhibits, the the approved plans. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is go back, go through those, and that will cover the findings in the first few of the, uh, uh, up to F, excuse me, w, D, e, to, through D, and then go back to the waivers where there's there's a little, but there's not very much. This should not take long. All right, so. Off. I'm sorry. I was just taking the highlight off of number 25. Um, 31, this is, I think, just a numbering issue. With 31, I had written something that was supposed to go in that I promised last time. That is now 32. Mm -hmm. Yep. At 31, there's something. I think when we accept 32, it'll fix 31, but. Okay. 
Good. So last time we had had a discussion about uh, providing a little more information about the the uh, uh, sustainability of the project, uh, and particularly I focused on the well. You can see what I did. It basically, uh, it aims at discussing uh, the approach they have to almost all electric uh, passive house, and with a phrase describing in a set in a phrase what it is passive house is, and the fact that there would be rooftop uh, PV cells for on, for on site generation, um, all of which except for the slight elaboration on what passive house is is uh, is taken from their their submission so it's it's really just intended to just be a straight a straightforward discussion um the, there's a footnote there i think it may be the only footnote in the entire thing but it refers to the specialized stretch code because i think one of us at least had suggested last time that they thought it was appropriate to mention that they would be required to do some of these things anyway, and that would be true of passive house. So that's fix. They want to fix 32. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Riccadelli. Mr. <laughs> um so there, this is this is a technicality, but um, so there there's two passive house versions. There's FIAS and uh, PHI. Both both are allowable under the code. So I wonder if we should not be putting FIAS in parentheses. Um, one's the international standard. One's the U.S. standard. Right. This is the U.S. standard. But what is the problem with? We'd be specifying which one they chose. They've already told us which ones they're choosing. They're choosing FIAS. Oh, okay. This, of course, is only a finding of fact, right? So it's not like it's a condition that they have to do it, but that that is what they've said they're using. So those are all the, the last of the little bit in the findings. And then we're on to conditions again. Um, so this... Eight, accepting August first, and then have to turn off the highlight. All right, then A two, A two, Mr. Klein. <laughs> so I have confirmation that we so we have revised civil plans that are dated August first. Uh, we do not have revised architectural plans for anything. Uh, neither do we have specific lighting plans and specific landscape plans. Those, all that information was included in presentations that were provided by the applicant. Um, and so in working back and forth with myself and Pat and Paul, we sort of came up with this notion that, um, so we'll still say that is the drawings dated March 9th with revision through August 1st, and also includes the supplemental materials prepared by UTL Inc., Sam Yetis Consultants, and offshoots and submitted to the board on May 2nd, May 16th, June 13th, July 10th, and August 1st, and consisting of the following sheets. And then, so the sheets here, these are the dates that are on the various sheets. Um, so you'll see the C's do have an 8 1. Um, the A's are all still three nines. And then so enumerating what is in the other packages. So project introduction, site context, sheets two through 19 of the 5-2 package. The bicycle parking information, which talks about you know where the parking is going to be, how much parking, and has some uh, indication of how they want to do the stacked parking. So that's included in that information. Uh, the material diagrams, um, that's the materials for the exterior of the building. Uh, the lighting plan which we go back and reference is on the June 13th. The EV charging station plan is on the June 13th. Uh, the landscape plans are on the June 13th. And then the solar impact study, uh, which we reference in the findings, that's cheap. That's also uh, on the August 1st. So 
this is sort of the best way we could find to sort of handle the difficult situation of not having a final updated set of drawings from the from the applicant. Right, and and it's it's helpful that the, not only is the date but the sheet number will make it easier for to find. I mean, the the point ultimately is that the people who have to look at the final plans need to know unambiguously what to look back at. And I think adding that helps a little, helps helps do that as well. Does anyone, does anyone, so I guess I should ask the question, does anybody have a better idea? Any, any suggestions or uh, objections to doing it this way? All right, let's let's take it as done. Okay. So I don't I don't know if we have anything else before we get before E where we I don't have anything in my notes. Christian, do you have anything? Um I would just go through just to make absolutely sure. These um, ah, so D two B, um. The request from the applicant was that the plan shall be, this is about the management plan. And then they had asked that it be submitted after its approval by the Executive Office of Housing and Livability. I had just rec wanted to recommend adding submitted to the board because it's unclear as to who it's supposed to be submitted to. Okay. Is there any comment on that? All right, seeing none. All right, and then the ease we just did, I just haven't got around to yeah, we've got all the, yeah. All right, so we can jump forward all the way pat all the way to the waivers at this point. E five, yeah, we did that. We did E six. And I'll go back and verify the numbering one last time before we have okay. the final version. Um, I don't know why that, what that is about. Mr. Haverty, is true that, isn't it, that once we can vote on this and if we need to, if the numbering changes and so forth, that's the kind of administrative correction that wouldn't require an additional, any additional action from the whole board. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Yes. We'll make sure that the names flow properly too. Um, all right, so that brings us back to the waivers again. Right. So the first waiver is what is E E three? Is that Mr. Klein? So uh so waiver, yeah. So waiver one we were fine with this is the step back. Waiver two has to do with the 24 foot rear yard. So there's only gonna be five. Uh number three has to do with landscaped open space and usable open space. Um Unfortunately, in the August 15th hearing, the applicant agreed to calculate those figures and then we closed the hearing. So we don't have actual numbers from them. Um, I tried to run the numbers myself um, and I was coming up with, um, so the building G GFA is listed as 49,000 square feet. I was coming up with around 4,900 square feet. 
between the ground floor level and the upper level patio for landscape. So they're actually close to complying with the 10%. They may actually comply with it. I just don't know for certain. Uh, we are certain that they don't comply with the usable open space. Um, we, uh, so the sort of going back and forth, rather than necessarily plugging in numbers, just say the applicant proposes landscaped open space approaching 10% and no usable open space. Right. Um, and that's just the best information we have. And then we just say the waiver is granted consistent with the approved plans and just leave it at that. So what's operative here is just that last, the waiver granted is consistent with the approved plans, which is sort of what the applicant had wanted. Having more precise numbers or having actual really wouldn't affect the bottom line particularly. We might conceivably have said you probably meet the landscape over, but in, in view of any of the, of the, in view of the fact that we can't be sure that that's true, we would not be on very solid grounds denying the waiver on the ground that they met it when we're not quite sure that they do. So I'm not, I think that this, this ends up taking us in a, in a more rigorous way, but pretty much to the same place. Is that basically right? Yeah. So then la not having any better information, this is giving what our understanding is. Yep. So anyone have any any suggestions, other calculations? All right. So why don't we pass on then the next one I think is number four, correct? It is. Here um, the, here one of the issues, the issue we struggled with last time was that the 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 presentation to us was somewhat unclear as to what it is that the applicant actually needed. From the beginning, they were been asking for an undifferentiated number of 43 bicycle spaces, but they've always been maintaining that they plan to provide much more than that. And they, uh, uh, and they specifically sought at our meeting on August the 15th uh, to encourage us to reduce they give them more flexibility by reducing down to the 60 and five that we discussed earlier as part of the conditions. Um, and that seemed to be what it is that they really needed and what it is that they really wanted. And obviously the 43 would be hard to justify because, and they had suggested at least that they wanted to go down to 21, which happens to be the number for the vehicle parking spaces that is just miles away from anything that uh, miles away from anything that that they actually proposed to do or ever justify to us that they needed to do. Um, so we have we're a little bit unclear as to what it is that we ought to do about that. Uh, one option is to sort of stick with the 43 and another is to just wave wave it to the extent that they actually are requesting of us in the plans that they provided. Uh, Mr. Haverty's uh, advice to us was is not to grant them with a waiver that is not reflected in approved plans. Um, the 60 and five are not really reflected in plans itself because those were those were orally requested and on August the 15th, and there's no plan that shows them. Um, but the earlier plan lays out where they would be and, and a great deal of information about them. Um, and we're sort of, we are where we are on that because our conditioning has, the condition that we approved a few minutes ago uh, focuses on the, the 60 and five. Um, I would be comfortable approving a waiver that is limited to the extent of what they said they needed the flexibility to do um, and would be reluctant, especially given the dramatic reduction in in the in the parking for, and that that and the the unusual nature of the TDM plan. I'd be very reluctant to to go more than they indicated that they wanted to do. So that that would be the view I take. It's a little bit stricter than what I was to toying with last week, 
uh, but as time went on, I, I felt increasingly that they have a proposal, they need a waiver to do that proposal, and we should allow them to do that and not allow a great deal more that we have no justification in the record for. Uh, so that's me trying to trying to uh, persuade you, but <laughs> I've been in a minority before. I can handle it. Does anyone else have a further discussion on this? And the next part right. is a total departure. I'm sorry? Say so that the the next section of this is a sort of a total departure from what we had proposed last time. So um, but basically this is just saying that this they are we're here confirming what they have specifically requested. Um and we had originally said that we would provide a, the waiver. I'm suggesting that we deny the waiver. Um is a waiver denied a waiver from the requirements of the bicycle parking design guidelines in section 6112 bicycle parking and the zoning bylaw is unnecessary as the board may modify the requirements of the bylaw based on specific conditions unique to the proposal that's in the bylaw uh, the bicycle parking indicated on the approved plans providing 60 long-term and five short-term bicycle parking spaces is accepted stacked bicycle parking is also approved per the approved plan um, and the reason I'm recommending this is that we are exercising our normal uh, actions that we're allowed to do, but I'm I'm very nervous about doing a blanket waiver of the bicycle, of this the bicycle section because it then they can get a then they don't have to do any parking at all, um, and there's other provisions about like the size of bikes parking spaces and things that have never been at issue that would also just uh, be be discarded. So I think it's important to maintain that. The only thing they've really talked about is the stacked parking. Um, so I did want to make sure that we indicated that that would be approved. Um, but otherwise, everything that they're requesting is stuff that we are allowed to uh, grant them. The only suggestion I would have for a change on that is to actually have the language state that uh, rather than to parking be accepted, that it's approved, just to mm -hmm. make it very clear that the board's granting that approval. So what? So what would you have? So in in five short term bicycle parking spaces is accepted. I would just change accepted to approved. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just to avoid any confusion. And that language is already there in the <clears throat> the approved plans. It's already there in the next sentence as well. Correct. Yeah. May I ask a question about this one? Absolutely. Mr. Drickadelli. So uh, this is referencing the approved plans. And after our last session, I was trying to track down the numbers. And when I look uh, at the, the latest architectural plan set, which uh, like Mr. Klein pointed out is, you know, has not been updated in quite some time now. The, the front page says um, 37 long-term bicycle parking spaces and six short-term spaces. So uh, I, I tend to agree with uh, Mr. Hanlon that I don't think that that would be adequate, but by saying, Based on the approved plans, are we contradicting ourselves, or or is that okay? Well, it raises an interesting question. The because the there is a specific bicycle plan, I think, in the June thirteenth hearing. Yeah. Which again, which doesn't have the it has numbers that are that were what the plan was then, and before they sought to reduce it. Uh, on August the 15th. Christian, do you have the ability to bring that up? Yeah, I am. I will have it for you in a second here. Well, that's the EV parking. Maybe. It's, it's, it's near the same one that shows the stacking. Yep. Um, well, if I reference the drawings where I said where exactly that could be found, 
So bike park information is oh May sixteenth. It's into May sixteenth. May sixteenth, two five. Okay. Wow. Open May sixteenth. It's called Barking Bicycle Parking Capacity Study. Let's go. You share. So here they they calculated there that they the total required was sixty four point eight spaces and that what was being provided was sixty four spaces. That's long term. And at that time they were at four point eight spaces and eight spaces. And this shows sort of where it is everything was supposed to be. Now, what we don't have, it would have been great to have, but all we got was a request to take what they had before and to reduce it down to 60 long-term and five short-term. Uh, but otherwise, and it's not, of course, completely clear exactly where that would happen, but this is probably more, it's later and and. I mean, this is where they were on May 16th. That's just, mm -hmm. as opposed to March 9th. Do you have any additional? No, this is just the ground floor. So we could. Uh, right back. So I'm a little bit, one of the things that's clear to me just before we get. I know that it's, I mean, the, it's quite awkward that the plans are as irregular as they are. And I'm sure that's that's all my fault because I wasn't really paying enough attention to making them um, formalized the very, at, in real time, the things that they were proposing to change. Um, but the fact is they're proposing 60 and five. And we actually are requiring 60 and five. Uh, that's a condition. It, if we allow, if we waived it up to 43, then we still they have a condition that it says 60 and five. So all that we're all that I think of that we're doing in connection with the waiver is making it agree with the conditions. And that that thought might make some of the difficulties of making all of the drawings that match up seem less important. Then now if I go back to our document. So we could say bicycle parking. Bicycle parking. Providing 60 long term and five short for bicycle parking spaces. We could say is approved per conditions five F5 and F6, I guess they were. F5 and F6. Do we want to list the findings as well? I don't think so. I... I guess, I mean, my sense of it, well, the findings are there and what they are. I guess the, the thing is they're not regulatory and the conditions are. But it, I don't know that there's any harm in it. The bicycle parking information plans, that's, that's what I called it in A2. Bicycle parking information, just bicycle parking information. So what this would, let's just clean this up. So waiver from the requirements of the bicycle parking design guidelines in section 6.1.12, bicycle parking in the zoning bylaw is unnecessary as the board may modify the requirements of the bylaw based on specific conditions unique to the proposal. The 
bicycle parking. Uh, so I, uh, I think it just says bicycle parking. Bicycle parking providing 60 long-term and five short-term bicycle parking spaces is approved per conditions F5 and F6. Stacked bicycle parking is also approved for the bicycle parking information. They provided. That flows better. Bicycle parking consisting of 60 long-term and five short-term bicycle parking spaces is approved per conditions F5 and F6. Stacked bicycle parking is also approved per the provided bicycle parking information. That read well to people? Looks good. It does. Okay. Paul, does that seem appropriate? Yes. Perfect. Well, that brings us to six. Um, so the applicant requests a waiver to allow 11 spaces. They had said 60% or 11. Did, and I wasn't sure if we wanted to include the term 60% or not. I think if we don't, we're we're just saying 11 spaces and we're not in any jeopardy any either way. Right. It, there's, there's a certain cognitive distant, dissonance that comes from the fact that they're providing 21 spaces and 60% of that is 12.6. And yeah. it, I mean, does that really mean that we're just doing 12.6? And what does that mean for the 11s? I kind of, I, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure to what extent I care about that because I'm not one yeah. of the architects and I'm not quite sure how problematic it would be to have 12 rather, but I, I think I would tend to go with the lesser number that they yep. ask for. Okay. And then similarly in seven, during the hearing, they had specifically talked about 22, not 21. So um, now here, uh, just to re re recapture the chair for a moment, Dan had uh, was had ideas that we were very attracted by on this, Mr. Riccardelli, last time, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And I wonder if there's anything that would need to be done to sort of open things up to to his thoughts on the matter or maybe i'm maybe i'm just misremembering but mr chair i think i think it just if i could re reiterate i think you know i was supposing that the single-sided aisle didn't need to be quite so large but um i think mr haverty pointed out the time that we should we should be granting what is proposed on the plan which is 22. um so i i think that's where we landed Okay, that sounds great. Now, one thing we could do as a compromise is say 21 and then put 22 in numbers so that... <laughs> so that everyone's confused? They know that we were ambivalent about it. There you go. All right, so they had... They had Quest of 21, we're leaving it at 22 per the approved plans. Okay. Well, actually, it's 21 now, right? Oh, no, we're really... I get it, yep. 22 is on the drawing, so that's what we're yeah. that's what we're doing. And then I just thought at the end of the decision, it should say it's the end of the decision. So people don't go looking for another page. <laughs> that's a good idea. The end. <laughs> with with fancy gothic type. I <laughs> just, to, just to get that out there. <laughs> so 
So there are no more comments or track changes. That's everything. All right, so we are now, we're now at the, um, at the point where we've we reviewed the entirety of the decision that we can put in 12 which which makes me feel very happy although we haven't achieved it yet um so what i was just in terms of a procedure we've usually gone through and given each of us an opportunity to say as much as they feel they have to say on uh, where they stand on the uh, stand on it, and I would would call the rule uh, allow us to to do that, um, and then at that point accept a motion to approve the uh, the plan that we have before us as we've amended it this evening. So having done that, um, I guess I I'll, let me just just call call the roll and um, and and you all know that you 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 get to do Miller the amount of time it takes to finally get to Miller time at the end uh, is indirectly proportional to the amount of time we spent talking about it. So the first person up is Mr. Klein. Well, thank you. Very much. Um, so as we had sort of said at the, we're reviewing initially the, the amount of time we've spent on this application. Um, it, you know, it was opened on May 2nd. Uh, we've had a consolidated set of hearings. I think we've had um, some very good uh, discussions and conversations with the applicants, uh, with the neighbors, with the abutters, uh, with those who are, are likely to be impacted both by the construction and by uh, you know this change to their neighborhood. Um, but I, I hope that everyone sort of comes away from this with a sense that what the what the board is really looking to approve here uh, is a project that is put forward by the Housing Corporation of Arlington to provide residences for both uh, current, and future residents of Arlington who don't have an opportunity to share in the, you know, the benefits of living in a, in our community and in our town. And I think that the uh, the package that has been proposed by the Housing Corporation of Arlington is a is a really strong package. I understand that they still have a ways to go in terms of funding, and we wish them the very best with that. I think that what we have come up with as a decision uh, meets the not only their requirements for providing a facility that they are able to actually uh, construct and manage, but also serves to uh, minimize the the impact on the, the residents, both short-term and long-term, who uh, currently are in this neighborhood and uh, would like to really see their neighborhood continue to flourish in the way it has to date. So um, I very much look forward to uh, Providing my vote in, in favor of the um, the special per, the comprehensive permit application with conditions. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Mr. Dupont. So I would just uh, second uh, what uh, Mr. Klein had just said very comprehensively and eloquently, and and add that I was really gratified um, in being part of this process. I think that all of the people involved, the applicant, all of the consultants on both sides um, and the and the uh, public who I thought expressed their concerns in a way that was very uh, were very constructive uh, and very supportive, even given some of the concerns and doubts that they had about it. And I just really appreciated the collegiality and the collaborative um, nature of the process through all of this. And, and really would like to commend the other members of the board as well as the other participants as to the amount of attention and, um, 
and and focus that they gave uh, to the process. Thank you, Mr. Dupont. Uh, Mr. Riccardelli. Yes, uh, you know I'm I'm happy to echo uh, what the previous two speakers said as well, and I'm looking forward to you know voting for this, uh, especially like a couple of you as a uh, East Arlington resident, uh, looking forward to having an all affordable housing development on our side of town. And I don't know if many of you know this, but I'm actually, one of my projects in my day job is an all affordable development that's also passive house. I know how hard it is to make these projects work. Um, and I, I've been impressed with everyone who's been involved in this process. So. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing it get built. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Mr. Rigardelli. Um, Mr. Holy. Um, yeah, I'm positive and I'm gonna vote yes to the to the project. And it's, you know, as mentioned by previous speakers, you know, this affordable housing is is important for the town, for the state in general, and more so for the town. And all the units are affordable. Um, that's a welcome. I, I don't think I've done or worked on a project where all the units are affordable. So it's a, and and it's well deserved. All the comments were addressed, you know, very, um, and with um, great. Um, I, it's not just addressing the comments; they went over and beyond in some of those, and uh, that's very impressive of the team. So, yes, um, great. That good luck to the team too, um, for this great project. Thank you, Mr. Holy. Uh, Ms. Hoffman isn't here. Uh, I'd like to, uh, we're, we're now at the point where we're dealing with associate members who, who will not be in a position to vote on this, but uh, but who uh, uh, who certainly are appropriately could, can comment on on what they believe, they think about it. So Mr. LeBlanc, I'm afraid you're going to end up being a non-voting member when we go down to the role again, but but you're still with us on this one. Yes, um, I think everyone's kind of said a lot of the you know same thoughts that I've had on this project. Um, you know, kind of in the the same vein of uh, Mr. Riccadelli. I'm over in East Darlington as well, kind of right down the street from this project, not that far. Um, so it'd be really great to to see what I think is a pretty well designed uh, project going up. Uh, you know, based on what we have, so it'd be it's really nice to see a nice well-designed piece of affordable housing going up. Um, it's kind of a, a rare feat um, uh, in, in around Boston. So it'd be great to to see this go up. And uh, if I was voting, I would be in favor of um, the proposal we have with the conditions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. So that that just leaves me. I think I, I, I agree with what almost every, well, with what everybody has said. Uh, I just like to underscore in some ways what a great place this is to have affordable housing. If you were looking at 15 minute cities, this is a five minute city and it, it's easy to get to the transportation, not just the 87 bus, but if you venture across the river, you can go to uh, uh, really get into the transportation system even more. Um, there's shopping there. There's lots of ways of relating to the town, and I think it'll be a great, a great addition to the town uh, to have this there. Uh, I I agree, agree completely with the with the commendation of the constructiveness of the neighbors. It's been a lot of peace. It's a lot of people participated early on, but some people stayed with us. They. I even imagined that we were building a relationship with them. I'd like to particularly uh, call out Ms. McCartney, who uh, honchoed the neighborhood letter that was submitted to us and who was there uh, raising questions that, that we had got answers to or we tried to get answers to and making the deliberations a lot better than they would have been without her participation and those of, of her neighbors that were also looking to her for leadership. Um, it's been my experience in 40Bs that even in the ones where there's a considerable amount of hostility and antagonism and uh, feelings are high, and that isn't necessarily true here, but when people just basically settle down to the public process, 
the public helps us through. And I think that every project that I've been in, on has been better because of the public participation. And I think that that's probably, uh, that's probably uh, true here as well. And finally, somebody on our side who has not gotten a mention yet, but who should be mentioned is uh, Sean Reardon, who has done yeah. a great job of, of helping us through uh, everything and dealing with all of this, the potential civil issues that he dealt with in a sensitive and a wise way. And I thought uh, that uh, if if he can click clip this out and put it on his website, uh, I'd like to say it was great to deal with him again. And uh, I look forward to a chance to doing that at some point in the future. Uh, so like the rest of you, I will vote on this when I get the opportunity. Uh, but in order to have that opportunity, somebody has to move to approve. I will uh, do that with the uh, the with the oversight from Mr. Haverty. Uh, I would move that the board approves the comprehensive permit with conditions for the application by the Housing Corporation of Arlington for their property at 10 Sunnyside Avenue in Arlington. So, Mr. Haverty, do we need to explicitly include the waivers in that motion, or should that be a separate motion? No, that can be part of the motion. And I would just also reference with the changes discussed tonight. With the changes discussed this evening. Yes. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. DuPont. Uh, we'll call the roll. Mr. Klein? Aye. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Ricardelli? Aye. Mr. Holy? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So the application uh, is approved. Mr. Haverty, uh, what, what are the next steps after this? It'll be filed. Well, you got to finish making the corrections discussed tonight, and then it has to be filed with the town clerk. Okay. So we will undertake to do that. Do I, we need to get it signed as well? One, yes, once you've made the changes. Right. Okay, well, we will endeavor, endeavor to do that and get that get that filed. Uh, and so I think the one thing that we haven't had, I didn't have a chance to do is thank you for your participation, Mr. Haverty, particularly, who's always been at our side on these things. And I have no idea how we'd handle the 40B process without him. Um, and so, uh, and thank you for you all for the thought and, and, and wisdom that you brought uh, you brought to bear from this. So we're at the point where we're ready to uh, we're ready to say goodbye to one another. Uh, but I wonder if there's some other announcements that uh, folk, that might be made now in terms of our future schedule and where we're going next. Mr. Klein, do you have something to say about that? Sure. Um, so we do have a hearing scheduled for August 26th. There are five items on the agenda. Um, we currently have two members who are unavailable for that date, so we do have uh, just just five who are available that night. And um, as I had spoken to Mr. Hanlon earlier, there's a possibility that his availability might be um, might be difficult. So I'm going to go ahead and talk to um, talk to Colleen uh, tomorrow about the possibility of uh, um, another date whether that might make more sense for us um, and then reach out to the applicants and explain the situation and see what, what they would prefer to do. Um, because it, it may just be that we only have four members present. And then all that means is that all four members do need to vote uh, in favor in order for something to be accepted. And some applicants may be willing to do that in, you know, because of the timing issues, but others may not want to do so. Um, and the, but the following week, uh, October, I think it's October 3rd, um, we do have a hearing that evening. It is an appeal of the decision of the building inspector in regards to uh, 106 Mount Vernon Street. Um, so we'll be getting more information out on that. Um, and then um, working with uh, with Colleen earlier today, there's going to be another hearing at the end of the month, um, at the end of October. So those are the our upcoming dates, um, but we won't have uh, any more comprehensive permit dates, at least, you know, knock on wood for the for the near future. I have not heard of any other sites that are pending. And uh, with the start of construction of uh, 10, 10, 1021, 1027, the board now has another, uh, does have a safe harbor provision that it can, um, can put forward in discussion with the planning department. So we'll have to look into that. 
Um, but otherwise, uh, we are back to our regular business. But to to echo what Mr. Hanlon said again, uh, you know, many many thanks to uh, to Paul Haverty again for all his assistance in helping us uh, for this now fourth uh, fourth here uh, set of hearings on comprehensive permits. So we really appreciate all of his efforts on our behalf. Absolutely, Absolutely. Christian. I Thank you. I just wanted to add on the twenty sixth. I'm yep. going to be out in uh, the Worcester area in the afternoon. Okay. So it could be difficult for me to get back. Okay. So I don't know. I mean, if we only had three people, the people had scheduled, uh, what would happen to that? Would we just not hold a hearing or? I mean, we would need to coordinate. I would need to talk to council and coordinate on how exactly we would do that. Um. I can make best efforts. I just yeah. I know what that day looks like, and it's going to be a little packed. Uh, so if all we were going to do that day is gather enough of us together to move to continue all the cases to, say, October 3rd or whenever the the next opportunity would be, I'm sure that, I mean, I could just call in on a phone mm -hmm. and and stay stay for that long, even if I were in if I were in somebody's hotel room, uh, hospital room. So uh, that shouldn't pose a huge problem as long as we know we have it and take care of it in advance. Okay. I have nothing further. All right then. So we've gotten through this and uh, thank you again for all of you. Um, we can see where we're going going forward. I should add that we have two outstanding decisions that need to be presented to the board and adopted uh, to let some people go forward who, whose cases we did we did do at our last general meeting. So those will be forthcoming. Um, and at that point, uh, I'd invite a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chair. Second. Moved by Mr. Klein, second by Mr. DuPont. Uh, <coughs> we'll go through the roll. Uh, Mr. Klein? Aye. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Ricardelli? Aye. Mr. Holy? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So good night and good luck. Somebody Thank said. you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.